つまりもともと日本になかったもんは大体養殖ってこったまあそれにあれだ Okay, so previously we talked about foodstuffs, but consumption as an act has a rather interesting relationship with not all stories. So I think there's two interesting vectors to look at this the body dialogue and the game dialogue. I think the Orc Lord arc of slime is a really good way to situate the discussion in this video. For context, there's this heated conflict with the orcs as part of a great disaster befalling the forest, and Rimuru has to stop them. He does so by consuming the orc lord with his skill, Predator. There's something there, right? The act of consumption recalls a rather curious pattern in Shitara slime. Rimuru solves quite a few problems and takes on a few more. Through consumption. He eats Ifrid, he temporarily eats Veldora, he eats Shizu, a fellow Japanese countryman. And this will really start to rear its head later in the series, but consumption is a really curious act in a lot of isekai. Previously, we talked about food, this way in which food is an object that can stand in for these larger discussions of modernistic fetishism. But here, let's focus on the consumption itself. It's not just literally consuming food or people or things. It's about the reasons why some of these characters consume and how that influences discussions on subjectivities and morality. So I'll go into my thoughts shortly, but let's start with you, Damien. Why do you think consumption is such a frequent mainstay of isekai, particularly not okay isekai? Consumption, in a way, is about domination, survival at all costs. The character eats to survive, like everyone, but also to gain power, which can help to expect this shitty new reality. It's a return to a more harsh reality. You stare at the steaming pit of hell where your world and humanity has its worthest. You're facing demons of your own kind, you confront your own monstrosity. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, since to me it's somewhat recollective of Julia Kristeva's abjection. Okay, so I'm gonna explain this. I think on the fundamental level, we're dealing with stories that have a particular Lacanian psychoanalytical bent to them. So, Jacques Lacan, right, devises this theory in which how subject formation kind of occurs, and it's about how the subject, attempting to wrestle semblance of control over things they don't understand, fall into the symbolic. So, the symbolic is a system that functions like a language. For Lacan, subject formation means taking on the trappings of the world around them. And so, on a strange level, this formation is quite literal. In isekai that revolve around consumption and misery and fighting, they take quite literally the physical material of the world around in which they're sent to. Arifurita, for instance, right at the nadir of the first arc, has to eat and consume the monsters around him to crawl his way out. In Tensei Shitara Slime, Rimuru eats for information. And that information is both metaphorical in terms of knowledge to appease the sage, but also information takes on a literal form in power ups. For Dungeon Seeker, Junpei eats the ghoul in the dungeon to absorb his power, but the demon you mentioned returning to that demon is where we get into Kristaban abjection. For Kristaba, the unconscious and the conscious aren't as well divided as we want to think. We're subjects, not objects, but when we're confronted by the nature of ourselves, As objects, as tools, corpses, what have you, we try to reject those elements of ourselves. And thus, there's an analogy here the idea of the corpse as a thing that can be consumed, that can be sort of understood as data to be consumed. And yet, nevertheless, they're still bodies. So, what do you think is the role of consumption, this kind of consuming of power and identity in Isekai? I have a lot of expression in my mind, like you are what you eat, it will be eaten, dog eat dog, and all of them are accurate to explain this role of consuming. When there is consumption, it's gay are not escapism anymore, because you absolutely don't want to live in a world like that, right? But hey, they don't choose this life, so they need to adapt, evolve. By eating, they become what they eat. A lot of them learn new information and new skill through consumption. But when they do that, a lot of these characters like Kumoko or Junpei lose something, their humanity, their mind. Physically, a lot of these characters are thinking in monster, right? But the paradox laid in the achievement of all of this. The more they eat, the more they become human. Exactly like in Nozoma no Fushi no Bokensha, the main character starts at skeleton living, and the more he develops, the more he evolves and obtains a true body of flesh, 
by embracing monstrosity via human traits. That's total mindfuck for me, and if that's why I love the specific isekai genre. But I found that pretty depressing in a way because I don't know what we need to understand of this. Are we monster? Maybe I'm searching too deep. No, I actually think that's really relevant. That emphasis on monstrosity is really important. I mean, I think it's not surprising that the isekai that focus on consumption also tend to focus on monstrosity. They can be physical monsters such as in Remonster or S rank behemoth or Kumoko, but they can also be internally metaphorical such as in Monster no Goshujinsama. But consider this, last time we talked about how a lot of isekai focus on these sort of morals of modernity. We Japanese are civilized and well developed and thus in these largely one way cultural exchanges, we can teach the natives how to manage or understand their world better than they can. But here, there's actually a twisted chthonic element to it. The discussions on dominating the world, they still remain because a lot of these people end up remaining and they end up acting like demon lords essentially. However, such discussions are intertwined with these drives to survive. They take on the elements of the world in the physical sense to dominate them. Why do you think that's the case? Mm. Except in the lightest of them, like slime, a lot of devoration isekai are about revenge. R revenge about the god, the world, a treason, someone, something, anything. But the ultimate motive of the character are vengeance. They are led by anger and hunger, it's primal, carnivorous, and it's also very destructive. Often they don't give a shit about the world, or potential mission. They have their purpose, and for that they can decide to destroy everything. People, country, their own body, their mind, their humanity, smash to pieces bit by bit, until satisfaction. Rimuru is a real exception, because even if he's powerful, he's seeking revenge for Chizu, which he devolved by love, because this is the purest form of love, ask the prey mentis for that. He is appeased, he don't want to destroy the world or the people, he always searching to be better and to find a pacifist way to resolve conflict. He want, as a monster, to drive them, his country and citizen, to a better state of themselves. In something like Kumodesga or Remonster, they absolutely don't give a shit. Yeah, and I think that one such case that really epitomizes a lot of these kinds of cruel isekai is definitely Remonster. It's this tofu niki, this ledger diary type of story with quick entries, fast movements, very little in between time. It's actually kind of reminiscent of the Keitai Shosetsu, the cell phone stories, but ones that tend to be written by men. You know, it's these very sort of like dark and grim stories that are on these cell phones that have first person perspectives and narratives, and they're very fast and they're very loose and they're also very informal. And so like, I see a sort of analog into there, but the story generally moves really quickly. And yet, nestled here is quite a bit of rape and murder, and there's a focus on consumption. The main character's power is influenced from his previous reincarnation loop, where he mentions that because of his previous psycho power, he can take advantage of it in the new world and climb his way up to the top of the goblin society he was born in. In fact, we had questions regarding about how and why this kind of story operated the way it did. So we got in touch with Kanikiro Kogitsune, the author of Remonster. We're able to pick his brain on a few things about how he came to this kind of work, but also why he chose use of some really grim actions like murder, rape, and slaughter. And in that conversation, Damien, was there something in particular that stood out for you? Mm, well, that doesn't surprise me because that's exactly what I think when I read it. You had a hero which is not really good, not really bad, neutral in fact, maybe a little chaotic, but still is more grey than white, and in fact, when you do something, it can be pretty hardcore, you solve all this problem by eating them, with Ro you can't have the small talk like with Rimuru, if he's pissed, interested by your power, or just bored, he eats you, and yep, that's how we do things here, what's your problem man? And even when he gained his new status, like when he had a leader or a wife, or kids, he don't decide to change his method. If it works, why did I need to make something different? Which is pretty disturbing, right? Because he hit people. <laughs> but that's how he survived. It's a, a kind of with survival logic, but it makes sense in this world, which doesn't kill us, make us stronger. 
Yeah, for me, I think it's pretty interesting because a lot of his remarks are actually rather straightforward. The powers of consumption were formed by his previous works. The diary is for the sake of a form that favors convenience, the text is largely meant to be a bit of an exploration. But one of the things he notes that's really curious is that when it comes to these settings that have rape and slavery, he says it's an interesting space to think about, which is really only possible because there is an acknowledgement that authors and readers know that there's a difference between reading reality and imaginary. And so, again, right, in a weird way, this recalls once again Lacanian dialogue. Recall Saito Tamaki in Sento Bishoujo, or Beautiful Fighting Girl, and how he's remarked on similar distinctions in the early 2000s. He notes that when we think of the psychopathology of the otaku, there's a clear distinction that can be made. Conterminous representations of a physical reality, we've got genjutsu, and another reality of fiction, riyadit, now, for Tamaki, he's focused on consumption, and in the case of Isekai, I think we can somewhat map out similar Lacan as media theorist messages in the case of production. Because remember, aside from the chapter on Henry Darger, the Sento Bishoujo focuses on how we read. In comparison, places like Shosetsu are social media platforms that uphold Isekai, playing a sort of loop between content creators and content creators as fans. Mm, yeah, well... It is like non isekai thing, like Goblin Slayer, right? Which is a dungeon cake. But yeah, they decide to dig inside the horror of reality to disturb their audience. What you see is horrible, but hey, relax, it's not real. You don't experiment this yourself. It's a kind of catharsis to confront our morality, twisting the heroes and the Thanatos, which is life, by the way. If you're disgusted by the hero's action in Kaifuku Jutsushi or in Domino Yusha, congrats, you're a perfectly sane human. You think it's horrible, but humanity created this. It's not because it's fictional that it cannot exist. Life is shitty, the world is shitty, even if you don't want to accept it. But I'm here to remind you this, you're living in this shitty world. In fact, you're part of it. Embrace your own monstrosity, be a monster, because you're the monstrous of this world. It is absolutely easier for purpose to make you puke, to feel you miserable and powerless, unable to react, only capable to be a voyeur. When you're looking at the abyss of humanity, he looks into you, and that's terrifying, right? And well, you accept the hero because the hero you're following don't have another choice to survive and escape to this fate but to kill, enslave and destroy what crosses path. Yes, absolutely. The discussion on misery and suffering brings us to the next dialogue, the game dialogue. Remember, I said that Julia Kristeva talks about how we don't want to think of ourselves as this thing that we can peer at and then realize the sort of limits of ourselves as thinking subjects. And yet, at the same time, we can actually kind of see these sorts of relationships, these sorts of anxieties, and these sorts of representations of us as objects played out entirely within the space of these kinds of isekai. And what is it in favor of? Well, it's actually in favor of this sort of mentality of the gaming dialogues, these game interfaces. And I think this need to kill and destroy is partially inculcated with these game elements. The game gives us a bit of an unintentionally cynical viewpoint. So there's this section in the Critique of Cynical Reason about how when we think of ideologies as things that concretize individuals to lived relations of production, there is this idea of the cynical subject. It's the subject that can dismantle or challenge ideologies, but they do so comically or unknowingly or embracingly. Now, I wouldn't say that these depictions are comical, but they're definitely in some ways very embracing of the moral lack and the implications of that moral lack. In some cheeky way, they draw attention to their game features, but such game features tend to lead to really detached conclusions. For instance, consider how the tech trees in Kumodeska, Nanika, and Remonster, and how that leads them down particular pathways, or how the world of Kumodeska or in Dungeon Seeker are pulled along by untrustworthy admins whose goals involve the suffering of the protagonist. There's this formal celebration of the game element through how it unabashedly incorporates it, but there's also a narratological condemnation of its implications. Here, it's a game world, but the gamic element oftentimes leads to their own suffering. This is reminiscent of Ueno Sunihiro's outline on Japan on survival-type stories. To Ueno, survival-type stories such as Death Note or Battle Royale are stories where young people face off against a seemingly unfair or unjust system, embodying what Sunihiro 
Hero considers games supported by an impersonal system and operating under clear-cut rules. The game's players are on equal footing, and their battles therein are what is depicted. However, those players that are sensitive of the nature of the game outmaneuver and rewrite its rules. To me, there seems to be a connection, even if it's not entirely clear. These devoration and revenge stories fundamentally distort the new game mechanic mentality. We know we're going to get screwed over, and thus we're going to take advantage of it to fight back against the system and screw everyone who gets in their way. And it's even more damning considering that relationships, classmates, allies, friends are completely discombobulated and the only thing that matters is consumption and power. In this sense, the digital games that these stories are based off of build off of this lineage and thus the social games their predecessors are based off of kind of smash together. Did we need to understand the kind of try harder and get good because life is in a game? <laughs> but here, in a specific concept, the world itself looks like a game. They gain skill, experience, evolve by consuming the others. It's totally twisted, but not entirely stupid because, well, you see, in Tatiana Yusha, Naofumi is the victim of this world, of an enormous conspiracy. And by that, you can accept and explain what he really did on someone was a slave because his class don't allow him to attack. He needs someone to be his sword, but no one wants to be the sword of the shield hero. He don't have another choice to use slavery to progress, to regain humanity and clean his name. He needs to be what they falsely think of him, an inhuman monster. In a way, we can acknowledge Raftalia as a pet, like Firo, which is a mount. So in fact, if we see it like this, Nofumi is like a solo MMO player with living equipment instead of Motoyasu or other hero like him who can attack and protect without real disabilities is betrayed by the system itself. Yeah, and I think looking back on Aniko's blog on Shosetsu, we can see it, right? So Aniko has written quite a bit on Shosetsu, and in one of the earlier posts, she refers to the development of the powers as uh, musso or unparalleled, which is actually a pretty standard term. It's a term that usually refers to a kind of game type and mentality where players just kind of mow down faceless enemies en masse. For example, the Dynasty Warrior kind of games. Patora actually uses it when he describes Isekai smartphone that he's acknowledging that there's a sort of musso element to these sorts of stories, but these musso elements are in favor of broader discussions about connection or belonging or understanding. That's why he says he's largely unfazed by the musso image. That's not his intention. And yet what's important is that it is video game slang. And that's really interesting in the context of the builds as you mentioned, because Aniko notes that the spear hero is for the sake of the video, kinda emblematic of the early 2000s, when net games were really strong, but for Naofumi, the shield is emblematic of the 2010s, when specialized party builds weren't. She notes, with the sizable decrease of the net game population, it's also the era where specialized builds are dying out because balanced parties are harder to arrange. So on one hand, we have this strange psychoanalytical perspective of miserable subjects understanding the conditions of their own misery through abject consumption. But that misery is inter-implicated with these sorts of game anxieties as societies press around them. When we think of consumption and the isekai that are really fucked up, they're actually about pretty interesting things to look at. There's a body dialogue and a game dialogue, but they don't really subsume the other. And this is probably one of the hardest kinds of isekai to think about because they tackle so many potentially worrisome topics. And yet, at the same time, they're also the ones that try to, in some ways, think about how they are in relation to the world they're in. To what ends it depends, it's always sort of unclear. And yet, there's layers upon layers of these game interfaces. This actually reminds me of Gaming, Essays on Algorithmic Culture by Alexander Galloway, in which Galloway talks about Civilization 3, and he talks about the interface of Civilization 3, and how he says that we might be tempted to think about it in the context of these sorts of neoliberal imperialist attitudes in which, you know, we can control and dominate and sort of we have to think about envisioned scarcities in the interface. But he says that what holds these sorts of beliefs in place is actually an emphasis on informatic systems. The system is the thing that shapes how we think about it. And I think we can't just take this sort of surface reading of we want to exert our power and so on and so forth simply in this way and then therefore we pathologize or try and come to a conclusion about this is what the drive is but rather we also have to consider how some of these writers might be understanding a system 
and how that system affects the way in which they produce and read a lot of these works. Absolutely, and that's really fascinating to see the author thinking about it when we are writing their stories. It's pretty great to discover they reflect on the game, the medium, and the scope of their message. The action of the characters, the background, are chiseled according to gaming rule, more precisely than we can think. It's not just random thinking, just to looking cool or edgy for the age. It responds to a puddle, an interrogation on the societies through fiction, a legitimate asking about evolution of our morals and our evident lack of communication. Can we assume that consuming and revenge is sikai are the exact opposite of what we talked before, the cool Japan stuff and the exaggerating Japan's exaltation? I think we can read it like that. Yes, of course, and I think there's something really important, which is that we can't commit an erasure here. There's a factor in all of this that we haven't really talked about, and that's the women. So, next time, let's talk about that, and let's look at isekai that are largely focused on women. Next time, we're going to take a look at isekai and how they tend to think, or portray, or utilize women in comparison to men.